Well, thank you guys again for joining us. And uh, this is part three of the baptism class. Today we're going to be asking the question, uh, how should baptism be done according to the Bible? How should it look? Uh, another question you might ask is, what should my baptism look like? Right? Because if we, uh, if we ask the question across the United States, and we ask the question, have you been baptized? Right? A lot of people are going to go, yeah. But when we say baptize, I think it, it falls under the umbrella of a couple different things, right? When we say baptize, people, a lot of people think, well, my baptism looked like this, or my baptism looked like that, or maybe it looked like something else, right? So we use the same word to describe three different things that are taking place, so which is really important that, that we kind of hone in on that. What does the Bible say, right? And what does it look like? And, and what, is the, what, is the, what are the scriptures asking us or telling us to do, right? And that's been a big disconnect among all denominations for a long time. Uh, you know, baptism in the early years uh, of the New Testament, everybody understood it was immersion. It was under the water, right? And until later on, uh, things started changing, Okay. Uh, I had a great uh, uh, lesson a guy taught. Uh, we have a man here that goes to church here. He is Orthodox uh, Greek. He grew up Orthodox Greek, actually in Greece. So he has a real insight to the, the original language, right? And he has some real insight about why they do what they do. And, and so in Greece, years and years ago, uh, when... Uh, invading co uh, countries would come in and run, overrun Greece and, and, and different things would happen in that area. The Persians would come down from the north and overrun them. What they would do is uh, the church decided we need to baptize our babies, sprinkle, because we want them to be Christians if they are taken slaves. So that's what they were doing for the purpose of anointing their children in case the Persians came in, overtook them, took their wives and children, killed the men, and took their kids back up to be slaves, they had some way of, of, of identifying their children as Christians. That's what they were doing. And, you know, different churches have taken on that, that idea of that's what they were going to do for kids. And, again, that falls out of that whole... Uh, uh, concept of uh, how we're born. Are we born with sin or are we born with grace, right? And we talked about that last week. That's really important that we understand there is a grace for all children, for people who can't understand the gospel, um, and, and we're covered under original grace, yeah. And those who believe that we're, we're under original sin, well, that there's a reason why they would want to sprinkle their children, right? So it's not, it's not because they are not doing the right thing. They love their children. That's why they do it, right? They just have a wrong way of looking at how we are born, right? Original grace versus original sin, okay? So I hope that helps somewhat to be able to, uh, to discern, right? Maybe we grew up in a denomination that was different from Rocky Ford, right? Okay. So uh, the disconnect between denominations, I said before, is whether or not somebody should be immersed or not, right? That's the, that's the disconnect. And, and while uh, accepting immersion as true baptism, many, Christ, many in Christendom, right, that's all Christians, right, believe it's proper to apply the baptism waters in other ways, especially by dabbling or, or dabbing or sprinkling or pouring a small amount of water on the head. Uh, we believe immersion is the only valid way of baptism. And we'll talk about that. I'll, I'll, I'll bring more proof text and more scriptures to, to talk about that, okay? In our American church, when someone says, I was baptized or I'm going to be baptized, a couple different images will come to our heads. Particularly on where you grew up in church, right? What kind of church you grew up in. So how many people were sprinkled as a baby? I know I was. Yeah, yeah. And my mom did it. We did it for Jana's parents had it done. We did it for our son Michael because she was connected to the United Methodist Church. And that's what they did. So that's what we did because we loved him. We thought that's what we're supposed to do, right? 
How many people have had a, uh, a baptism or a, uh, by pouring, right? Pouring, yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's a, there's a, either they do it by hand or they pour it over, or, or they'll actually use a pitcher of some sort or something like that and pour it over your head, right? And others would use uh, a, a baptism, they would put, you know, water from a, from a fountain of some sort and, and they will dab water and sprinkle it on the forehead or, or, or you know, put a cross on the forehead, however that may look, right? And, and so a lot of times these are, these are called, right, whether you're immersed or whether you, you have a sprinkling or a dabbing or a pouring, and to our American culture, we call that what? Baptism, right? Yeah, yeah. And that can be confusing. And for some people, frustrating, right? Uh, my brother, I'm going to tell on him. My, brother's, my brother David is my youngest brother, okay? He was sprinkled like I was as a baby. My mom did it, right? So when he got married in order to join the church and marry his wife, he had to be baptized again. Now this time, it was pouring water. So he went through that, right? So him and his wife, after I became a Christian and I started ministering to people, uh, I started talking to her about being baptized, and she was like, well, I've never had that. I never had what you're talking about, this immersion underwater. And my brother stands up and says, wait a minute. How many different types of baptism are there? Because I've been sprinkled, I've been poured, and now you're telling me I need to be immersed. Is there another one? I said, no, I think that's all of them. <laughs> You've got them all covered. Right? But it, it's frustrating. He, he's asking the question, who's right? And I think it's a valid question. That's a fair question. Who's right? Which one should I do? Right? And I think that's, a, I think that's fair. In the purest form, baptism is, is the, the momentary immersion of a person into a pool of water. I mean, that's the basic form, right? It is the momentary immersion of putting someone under the water in a pool of water and then bringing them back up. That's, that's I mean, if we're going to describe what it looks like, that's it, right? The English word, we've said this before, the English word baptize comes from the Greek word baptizo, okay? There is no English word. The English word, if we, were, if we were using all English words, we would say, you need to be immersed. Okay? Because that's what it would mean. Right? That would be the closest word we would have for baptizo, immersed. But instead, what we did is we took, which, which is, English is really good about this, about using other languages, adapting their word, and then making it English. Right? Baptize, baptizo, baptism, baptismos would be baptism, okay? So you see how that works. So what they're really doing is what we're saying, we may say baptize, we're saying baptizo. That's the Greek word, okay? And baptizo means to immerse, to sink, to dip, to plunge something under the water. Jesus would even say that word at the Last Supper, which is kind of cool. When he and Judas are dipping their bread in the same... Uh, liquid, same sop, or, or same uh, kind of a, a what's, it, what's it called? Oil. oil, yeah, it's like an oil. Like, you've got, like you, go, you guys go to Olive Garden, right? You dip your oil in the bread and all that, and you eat, right? I don't, but a lot of people like that. Uh, they're dipping, right? The word is baptizo. They're immersing their bread in the oil. Kind of cool when you think about it. Right? So it means to immerse, to plunge, to dip someone under the water. I'm on page two. The Greek word, I'm at the top of the page, the Greek word, the Greek vocabulary that the apostles use. Okay, the original language is called Koine Greek. And that is a dead language. Now, if you've been to the What We Believe class or maybe to How Do I Study My Bible, you've already heard this. But the, uh, what's happened with the, the original Greek language, Koine Greek, is it is dead. It's no longer used. And our English language is ever-evolving, right? There are words that are added to it every year. Some of them I don't even understand, right? There are new words that are added every year. And that's a living, breathing 
evolving, changing language, which is much different from the Greek language, the Koine Greek, which is dead. It's frozen in time. It will not change. So the word baptizo will never change. Do you see how God's working here? He's recorded the Bible in two languages that will never change. The Koine Greek, which is where we get our New Testament, is a frozen language. It's not going to change. What will change is the translations if we're not careful. Right? But the original will never change. They're using a different Greek language now in Greece and other places where the Greek language is used. That's a different style. Different, they may be saying words, but it's a different style. Okay? So, which is really cool. It really, it really helps us to be able to say, all right, well, the Bible, what it's saying is, is locked. It says it. It's frozen. It's dead. It's, or the word is alive, but the language is dead, and it's never going to change. All right? I took a little sidestep there, but I think that's helpful for us to kind of understand that. Yeah, that we can trust the words that are being used. So in the original Greek language, there are three words to describe what we call, in our English umbrella, right? We call them all baptism, but they have three separate words to describe what we say is baptism. So let me, let, let me point this out, okay? So the first word is baptism. So we already talked about that's immersion under the water, okay? The next word that they would use for pouring is and that's pouring. Okay? This is pouring. Nowhere in Scripture does it say this is how salvation is applied. It never uses this word. It always uses this word to describe what's happening and the action that's taking place. Okay? The other word for sprinkling is rantiso. Okay? Rantiso. So three separate words to describe what we call one thing. If we're going to do things like the Bible tells us, right? If we're going to do things, if, if things in the Bible have meaning and purpose and, and they're telling us what to do, let's do that. Does that make sense? I mean, if it says to, that to be baptized, then let's not do maiso or rentiso. Let's do baptizo. That's what it's telling us to do, right? Yeah. Are, are those other two words ever used in the Bible? Yes, yes. Uh, pouring out of love, pouring out of the Spirit, uh, to describe something being dispensed out of, right, is the word or the, the phrasing. And in rantizo, there is a, there's an idea of sprinkling of blood, Right? This used to talk about how the priest would uh, sanctify or would uh, 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 make holy, right? Uh, there's the sprinkling of a, of a, of a hyssop branch or, or, or leaves they would sprinkle, right? But it's never used in the, in the context of baptized for forgiveness of sins. Does that make sense, you guys? So you kind of see where we're coming from as far as the uh, building the case for, right? That immersion, the what we see and how it's described, really helps out also. But the but the phraseology or the words that are used are important. Okay. Yeah. And it's interesting that in every instance in the in the Greek, the Koine Greek. Baptizo is, is used to describe the how or the what is taking place, right? Uh, it, it's also only ever used to talk about, well, other than the one time when Jesus is dipping the bread with, with Jewess, right? 
That there's no other instance where anything else is described other than baptism being for uh, the purpose of forgiveness of sins and receiving the Holy Spirit. Okay? And nowhere in Scripture do we see the command or an example of someone being sprinkled or poured over with water for the purpose of salvation. And upon those couple of facts, right, it's safe to conclude that no other pouring or sprinkling is baptism as described in the Bible. Okay? Now, for all of us who have been poured or sprinkled, right, there's now an uneasiness or a, a decision to make, right? Do I, and I've heard this before, do I go against what my parents taught Right? Am I going to upset them if I change now what I think? Right? Or is there a decision now that I need to make once I've learned right, something different? It's kind of like a, a, an update to your phone, right? We don't always like the updates because they're inconvenient, right? And they change the way we're going, or the direction, or how things are going. Uh, but they're an update. They're an improvement. They're, they're new information that's going into your phone, right? Or your iPad or computer, whatever it may be, right? And you have to decide at some point, am I going to accept the update, right? So this is not one of those moments where I'm pointing you out or I'm, I'm, I'm saying you're wrong or they were wrong. This is a moment where you have new information. You have to decide, am I going to update, right, my faith, Am I going to uh, take this new information and do something with it? Right? And people have asked before, they said, well, even if I say yes, right? Does it make the other one bad? No, not at all. I don't think God's going to fault us for doing something right twice. Right? I mean, good intentions are good intentions. Good, good movement is good movement, right? Yeah. Doing the right thing is always the right thing. So I just want to, to, just, just to touch the elephant, right? Just say, all right, here it is. Let's talk about it. If it's here, let's talk about it, all right? Let's just move from that place and say, okay, I now understand that, that you know, from what Scripture says, there's probably something different. It doesn't make my parents right or wrong. It doesn't make them uh, bad people. It just means I have new information. Yeah. To say, now here, here, here's something that I would say, okay? To say that someone is baptized or, or someone has been baptized in some other way than immersion is like saying someone can drink from the cup of the Lord's Supper in any fashion they like other than swallowing. You have to swallow, right? In order to partake of the cup, right, you, you have to take and swallow, right? To say that I can take the cup and then pour it on the floor or I can pour it into the trap on my forehead, right? It just doesn't make sense, right? When Scripture says that to drink from the cup, as Jesus says, right, then it's let's drink from the cup. So when Scripture says let's baptize, then let's do that. Uh, a famous German priest, Martin Luther, a lot of you are going to know that name, right? He said, I would have those who are to be baptized completely immersed in the water as the word of God says and as the gospel indicates. To Martin Luther, the Greek word baptism means immersion, and the examples we see in Scripture require it. The description of baptism in Scripture clearly points toward immersion under the water. The active immersion of water in water is by design intended to symbolize the saving events of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Now, this is where I'm going I'm uh, I'm to have us read a couple of Scriptures together. Okay? Um, if anybody would like to read, they're right there in front of you. Uh, Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 10. If somebody would read that, I would appreciate it. Anybody? Okay. All right, thank you, Ben. Verse 3 through 10. Or you 
Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead to the glory of the Father, we too may, have, may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. Thank you, Ben. So Paul's writing to the Roman church. He's writing to Christians who have already been have already been baptized, who've already given their lives to Christ. He's writing to the church, okay? And he's reminding them, don't you all remember, when you were baptized, you were baptized into Christ's death, burial, and resurrection for a purpose, right? And he's explaining to them, you died just as he died. And the old you died, you've been set free when you've been raised up with Christ. And just as Jesus died for all the sins, right, once for all, yeah, you receive that grace also, right? You receive that forgiveness also. So it's really cool he explains that, how he explains it. It's probably one of the most compelling pieces of Scripture that explains baptism. When he says that you were buried, okay? I'm going to ask a silly question, okay? Can you be buried? When you're sprinkled? No. No, right? Can you be buried when water is poured over your head? No. no. Can you be buried in water when you are immersed, sunk, all the way to the bottom of the pool? Yeah, yeah, right? You, you are buried in that water. You are covered over, right? Yeah. And that's the imagery he's trying to... To, to formulate and give us there is that the immersion, the plunging, the dipping, the, the, uh, the pushing you under the water, right, is a burial. And then when we, we are raised up, we are raised up new in Christ. It's a beautiful picture. So, so can somebody read Colossians chapter 2, verse 12 for me? I'll take that. Okay. Colossians 2, 12. Having, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him, through your faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. Yeah. Same picture, right? Yeah. Same picture. Buried in baptism, raised with Christ, through the working of God, who raised Jesus, right? So let me ask the question, because this is going to get asked somewhere down the road. Somebody's going to ask you, hey, well, I'm going to save this. The, the theological, deep doctrinal stuff for next week. But, but somebody's going to ask you the question, who's working at baptism? Is it a work or not? And I'll answer that next week. But, but Colossians 2.12 says that God's working. I'm not working. Some people would describe baptism as a moment where you're leveraging God right, to save you. You're making God save you. Because you're the one forcing him to do that. No, that's not how it works. It, clearly it says, God's the one working, right? I'm not working. If I'm being baptized, in fact, I'm submitting. I'm just, I'm, I'm just giving of myself. This, I, I'm, at, at death, I'm not working, right? That's when you stop working, right? When you die, you stop working. Your, your functions of your body shut down, right? So there's no, I'm not working, the person, the person who is maybe baptizing me may be exerting a little force, but God is the one who is applying the grace and the salvation. Does that make sense? He's the one who's working because Colossians says he is. Can somebody read 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 20 through 21? Thank you, Kelly. 1 Peter 3, 20 through 21. To those 
who were disobedient long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism now, that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience towards God. It saves you by the resurrection of Christ, Jesus Christ. It saves you by the what? Resurrection. resurrection. That same work that Paul was talking about in Colossians, that, that God raised up Jesus, right? That same work, now Peter's describing that we are saved by that resurrection because of the cross, because of the, his death, because of the grave, because of the resurrection that Sunday morning, we now have new life. You see how it all comes together and all the scriptures begin to make sense together? Now what he, Peter's talking about is he's talking about what happened with Noah and his family. And when he says eight and all, he's talking about Noah and his wife and his three boys and their wives. So that's eight, right? They're all inside the boat. The water came, the boat lifted them up, the water lifted them up and saved them, right, from death that was going to happen to everybody else because they didn't believe, right? They didn't have faith. Uh, so he's saying, because that happened to those eight people, he's saying, now listen, because of that, now baptism also saves you. You hear it? And then he goes on to say, listen, there's nothing special about the water. Right? That's not holy water over there. I don't stand over that water. I don't have somebody else come in and, and, and sprinkle something into it. Or There's no magical formula about the water. It's the water that comes out of the ground. And yes, we clean it quite often. Because we use it quite often, which is awesome. But th there's nothing special about the water. It's not through, he says it's not for the removal of dirt from the body. It's not a bath. Right? It, it is joining us to Jesus. God's the one working. He's the one who is applying the grace, the blood of Jesus, to our lives. And, and we receive the Holy Spirit. God in us. No longer God with us. No longer God above us. But God in us. So important. So you'll see uh, in the, on your page there, on page three, I'll describe a little bit of these, uh, that, that, uh, a little bit more in detail. And I think I've already talked about these already. But the, the idea of being buried with Christ and baptism in Romans chapter six, uh, and Colossians being buried with him again and then being raised up with him, and we see the work of God taking place. And in 1 Peter, we look at water, uh, symbolizes baptism, that also saves you, and it saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And based on these three scriptures, just these three, based on these three scriptures, we can see that, uh, we can conclude that baptism is the point in which both uh, the sinner is buried in baptism with Jesus Christ and his death, and is also raised up uh, in Jesus Christ to have a new life in him. So, uh, it's hard to, uh, to say, uh, if, if someone would say, uh, if I'm sprinkled or if I uh, had a, a pouring as a baptism, it would be hard to identify with being buried and also being raised up using those modes of baptism. So uh, we see again, the, uh, what makes sense, right, that all fits together is when we are immersed, when we are baptized, baptizo, and when we are uh, immersed into the water, we are buried with Christ, just as Romans said, and also Colossians and First Peter, that we're being immersed in the water and then being raised up new in Christ Jesus. So that's very important. I want to share with you uh, a couple more scriptures that talk about uh, some great examples of uh, how we see baptism taking place. Uh, there are the uh, elements of uh, geographic location and, and also uh, the, the idea of how much water is needed for a baptism. So the first one would be in John chapter 3, uh, ch uh, verse 23 through uh, 
verse 23, it says, Now John, the baptizer, uh, John was baptizing at Anon near a place called Sal uh, Salim. And because there was plenty of water there, Scripture says, and people were coming to be and being baptized. The idea I want you to see there is that there was plenty of water. You wouldn't need plenty of water if, if John is sprinkling or if he's pouring. You could just do that from a, a, some sort of an object or a bucket that you brought out there with you. You could have done that anywhere, but he had to do it in a place where there was plenty of water on the Jordan River. And that's why they're making that, uh, that comment. Uh, in Matthew chapter 3, we see Jesus himself being baptized. Uh, Matthew chapter 3, verses 16 through 17 says, As soon as Jesus was baptized, right, same word, baptizo, immersion under the water, that he says he went up out of the water, and at that moment the heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, who I am well pleased, whom I love. Now I want you to notice that that. that the, the geographic location of what's taking place, Jesus is baptized, and it says when he came up out of the water, that means he had to go into the water or underneath the water. You couldn't do that in a sprinkling fountain or, or a pouring of a bucket or, or a pitcher of water. You couldn't do that, pour, that coming up out of the water. You can only do that when you were immersed in the water itself. And it's something incredible here. We see at Jesus' baptism the three persons of, of God, right? We see the Father, we see the Son, and we see the Holy Spirit. And it's so incredible that that happens. And, I, and, and in Luke chapter 15, verse 10, Jesus says that when a sinner repents, right, that when someone comes to God and gives their life to Christ, that the angels in heaven rejoice. There is something special happening at baptism. I think that's one of the reasons why Jesus was baptizo, was to give us a great example, to show us that something amazing is happening when we are giving our lives to follow Him. I want to show you one more piece of Scripture, and it comes out of Acts chapter 8, verses 38 through 39. Uh, it's the uh, disciple Philip, right? He is, uh, it's after Jesus has... Uh, has risen. It's after after Jesus has ascended back into heaven. It's Acts. It's the it's the moment when the church is exploding. It's beginning. Uh, it's the Acts of the, the of the apostles. They're sharing the good news of Jesus all over. So Philip is doing the same. Philip comes alongside uh, a man from Ethiopia who is probably uh, someone who's high up or is working for somebody who is high up in the treasury or in the government uh, of Ethiopia. And so Philip comes alongside this man's chariot and hears him reading from Scripture. He reads him, hears him reading from Isaiah chapter 56. And he's, in verse 38, he says, Look, the man says to Philip, I don't really understand what I'm reading. Is the prophet Isaiah talking about himself or is he talking about someone else? And this is a great opportunity for Philip to come alongside him and say, let me tell you the rest of the story about Jesus. Right? And he begins to preach to him about Jesus and the good news of the gospel. And, it, and, and after hearing this, the, I want you to understand that the gospel always includes a response. There's a moment where someone decides that I need to now follow Jesus. I need, to, I need to give my life to him. And, and in verse 38, it says, Look, here is water. The man says that. While they're riding in the chariot. He says, What can stand in the way of me being baptized? And the man gave orders for the chariot to stop. And both Philip and the Ethiopian man went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the, third, the Spirit uh, of the Lord suddenly took Philip away. And the man did not see Philip again, but he went on his way rejoicing. What's incredible about this story is it really kind of anchors something that's happened in Ethiopia itself. Uh, that is a country in northern Africa that has for years been Muslim-run, Muslim-majority. Uh, and people can't understand why there's such a large number of Christians in a Muslim country. 
I think this is the reason why. I think because Philip taught this man about Jesus, he probably went back home, shared with his family, shared with his friends, that Jesus is now the way, that this is how you come to faith, that this is the message of the gospel, and that they responded in ways that, that he responded and were baptized. And I think that's why there's such a high number of Christians in a Muslim country. It's really incredible that to see how uh, the gospel has unfolded, unfolded and affected all of our world. And I hope and I pray that these scriptures that we've talked about, uh, Romans 6 and Colossians 2 and 1 Peter 3, talking about what happens at baptism, right? And then we get to see in John and Matthew and Acts, we get to see some, uh, some examples of baptism, the mode of what's taking place. I hope this has really helped you with some decisions that you might be pondering. If you have more questions or you want to talk, please, please email me at mark at rff.church or you can find me on Facebook or I'm also monitoring the, the Rocky Fork Facebook page so you can personal message me there. If you want to talk or if you have more questions, I would love to hear from you. God bless you guys. Have a great rest of your week. I'll see you back here next.